Good morning, everyone, and you're all very welcome to the Regale seminar that focuses on community education in Ireland. We're delighted that you all are here today. So let's get to know each other a little bit more. And if you want to put in your name, organization and the country you come from in the chat box, that would be great just to say hello, as we would if we were in person. Um, maybe next time uh, we'll have you in person in Ireland. We know that there's going to be a study visit. So for the virtual visit, you're all very welcome today. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of the work that we do in AIMFIS with regards to networking and building, because that's really the focus of the Regale project. Um, and we have a really brilliant lineup today as well. But I think the most important thing for us is participation, getting your views, discussion, questions. So look forward to everybody's contribution. It's a peer learning webinar, so it's about learning from each other. And really, that's the way uh, this work has been outlined and, and developed uh, by my colleague, Ajem. Uh, with the team in the EAA. So AGEM leads out on this project. And the project, the Regale project is a key action three from the Erasmus. So it's a really big project, expertly uh, led out by EAA. So we have Tina and Ola here today as well, uh, who are giving a bit of a wave there. There are 11 partners and seven associate partners. So there's a huge amount involved, but I think we've just learned so much from the different partners as well. And I suppose our contribution today is around the knowledge and expertise from a from a practice perspective, from a theory perspective on community education in Ireland. So my colleague, Suzanne Kyle, is gonna be talking about the Community Education Network. Uh, our member organization, Maynooth University, Dr. Camilla Fitzsimons is gonna be talking about theory. Uh, Mary Marr, uh, an organization, the Dublin Adult Learning Center. And I was there quite recently and I had an in-person visit after about two years. So it was brilliant to be able to see the great work that happens in uh, Dublin Adult Learning Center is gonna give you that practice perspective as well. So in terms of the Regale project, you can find out more on the website and learn a bit more about what the work um, of the project is. As I said, it's, it's a very large project, but the main focus is about the development of networks, setting them up or reinforcing networks to increase impact and sustainability of adult education organizations at a local level and how they link in with local authorities. And so as we think about the work of Ain't This, um, the word Ain't This is unity. So it's about being together. It's about a, a giant network and I suppose a family of everybody involved you know, are committed to adult and community education in Ireland. And we also have international members. Um, so really, I can talk a little bit about how we develop that network uh, and the value of it. In terms of you know, getting the perspective of learners, we have a National FET Learner Forum. So a lot of our work you know, is really about getting the learner perspective and how that informs our policy work. In terms of our membership, to kind of give you an understanding of that, we have 600 members and they're from community education organizations, further education and training and higher education institutions. So, you know, the whole breadth of the lifelong learning spectrum is part of our membership. So we really draw on that. Our advocacy focuses on sustainable funding for community education uh, to ensure that you know, groups can respond to local needs effectively. And also, I suppose more pressing now is like the future of community education in Ireland and how people can really have a good career and an opportunity to both commit to this area of work as well, something that we're really focused on. But really, moreover than that, is creating communities of practice and communities of support and peer learning. Uh, and my colleague Suzanne is going to talk about the community education network and really how that network is a space for groups to come together to be able to, you know, articulate the issues, come up with solutions, and also to share understanding about the principles and the values of community education so that it lives on and continues from the strong basis that it has, but into the future as well. We also engage in advocacy work that is research-based. So we had a really interesting research report that we published last year, the Community Education Network Census, and I know it'll be popped in the chat and you can read that later. But what that does is it provides an evidence base. We all know the value of community education in Ireland and the broad impact, but this is one way that we try to develop a real understanding to influence our advocacy work. Uh, and I suppose another thing is like with community education, it's like we know how effective it is and the value, but often it's hard to articulate in terms of policy. And I'm just thinking of Kathleen McDonough Clark, who uh, is part of a community education organization that engages with members of the traveler community. She says, we don't just provide education, we create a space uh, that enables people to engage. So it's much broader than that. It's the pedagogy, it's how you feel in the community education organizations, all of the outreach work. So it's how we, as we communicate that out and I hope we'll be able to have a, you know, a lot of discussion today to be able to uh, share our understanding and our experience, because I think it's something that we probably don't shout enough about. I think community education in Ireland is so fantastic because of the passion. And at our policy day during the Adult Learners fe uh, Festivals that we can't run on passion alone. We have to have, uh, you know, funding and to be supported, have that recognition. And that's what we do in Aintus. 
So in terms of, as with the impact and the importance of networks, what we've seen over the course of the pandemic is that people from the traveling community have been, uh, the drop in participation is by about 25%. We know that the impact that the war in Ukraine has had on in terms of community education organizations responding to local need uh, and having a network where people can share their expertise, uh, expertise, what they're doing, their capacity is really helpful. And what we saw during the Star Wars is that amazing things can happen if people work together. So, uh, and, and what we try to do in terms of the kinds of provision that we, we believe should be learner centered, uh, that learners have agency, that they can build their confidence, that they engage in kind of learning that suits them, whether it's accredited or non-accredited, that they engage in a pedagogic process that supports critical thinking. Uh, and ultimately it's about social change and a solid foundation for people to engage in learning throughout their lives. So all of that sounds quite detailed and theoretical. And I suppose our challenge in advocacy is like, how do you maintain and uh, support and capture community education and then have it effectively funded and supported and recognized? And that's what we've been doing in Nathus for over 50 years. But we're here today to learn as well from yourself, sharing our, our experience. So just a couple of things just to end on in terms of networking and what we're trying to do as uh, over the course of the Regale project is that when we talk to members of the policy day uh, that we had, as I mentioned before, during the Adult Learners Festival, if you have a multi-stakeholder network, community education organizations need to be treated as an equal partner and there needs to be what was described as accountable autonomy uh, in terms of how funding is used, that uh, organizations are supported to use it in a way that's most appropriate uh, to the needs of the local community and their learners. So having a, an equitable partnership and network is really important. And that's what we've learned over the years as well. Uh, we also know that when you work together, advocacy can be really effective. And we secured a 10 million fund, the Mitigating Educational Disadvantage Fund for community education organizations. We did a review of that in a report that we can pop in the chat. An organization said that they wouldn't have survived without that. So that's an important element of our work. And the value of networks has been able to advocate at local level. You really understand the context, the needs of learners, and then national organizations can support that, or international and European, like the EAA does a, such a brilliant advocacy job at European level as well. It's also about what we, we talk about, sharing learning and succession planning, and thinking about how we can support people into the community education field as well, and the sharing of knowledge. And what we tried to do is like, there's so much expertise built up over decades in Ireland, and how can we capture that and support people um, into the future as well, who want to work in this area? We think it's a vital part of that education field um, and it's an authentic way to engage with learners. And I suppose just to end on an Irish, and my Irish uh, language knowledge is terrible. And I did some classes and we did them in Anthus as well, but I'm gonna do uh, just I suppose one quick sentence here. And I think it is about what we're trying to do with the regale and the Irish phrase is there's no strength without unity. So if we're trying to build a really strong adult education community at local, regional, national, European level, we really need to do it together to draw on everybody's expertise. So I'll pass to my colleague, Ajim, who's going to lead out and sharing the rest of the day. And I hope you really enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Neve. Um, it was a great welcome. And it, it's always great to have you as the aim to see you at our event. So thank you so much for uh, coming and starting this webinar. Uh, hello all, my name is Eja Makarja and I'm the EU Projects Officer in AINTIS. Uh, so this webinar is hosted with EAEA. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming, you all. Uh, and this webinar will be complemented by a study visit in Ireland in June. So uh, don't forget to apply in the Regali Network website if you would like to join us uh, during this study visit. And now we will learn more about the Community Education Ireland and the AINTAS National Community Education Network, what we call CEN. Uh, the focus will be the strengths of the sector and some of the issues that community education providers face and uh, which is discussed and addressed through the CEN. This will be explained by an amazing expert, Suzanne Kyle. Uh, Suzanne Kyle is responsible for ensuring a coordinated approach to community education work with an AINTAS and supporting the delivery of community education initiatives and overseeing the development of the community education network. Suzanne has worked in the community and voluntary sector for over 20 years in the areas of community development and adult education. She is currently undertaking a PhD at Maynooth University and her research interests include the role of community education in the disruption of far-right discourses through the promotion of equality and social solidarity. 
So now I want to leave the floor to Gainta's Senior Community Education Officer, Suzanne Kyle. Thanks, Sarah Jim, for that lovely introduction. Um, and welcome to everybody. It's lovely to see people um, from all over the world here this morning. Um, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak. Um, it's quite uh, a daunting or impossible task uh, to talk, uh, to give a, a really, really big overview of what community education is um, and the CEN in the space of um, this time that we have this morning. So, what I'll be giving this morning is a very, very broad overview. I will leave loads out because it's it's a very um, interesting and complex area. So you can only cover so much in a short space of time. Um, but just before we start, uh, just um, Nia finished off um, her input there on with that Irish phrase, Ninart Lekarlakela, and just as well that Ainsus that the meaning of Ainsus is unity. So I think that this that's the theme running through um, all of these. Um, um, interactions through the Rogali project. So it's lovely to be here as part of that. Um, so I'm just going to share a PowerPoint. I'm, I'm conscious that we're here for an hour and a half. I won't bombard people with loads of text, but I just thought it might be useful um, to use this here. So I'll share my screen and hopefully it will work okay. Hey Jim, is that working okay? It's starting, I think, yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, I'll just do a slideshow view here. Um, so again, just um, this is very, very broad. It won't encompass everything. Um, it's just a, a broad overview of community education in Ireland. Um, and a lot of uh, people here will um, be very familiar with community education. They mightn't necessarily call it community education. Um, you know, people might consider, talk about popular education or non-formal education. Um, I, I've seen somebody there, Maya, from um, the Association of Folk High Schools. So that a lot of the folk high schools would have a lot in common with community education. But this is a little bit about the context in Ireland. And just in terms of a very, very broad overview, Review. Um, community education, it's very, very much reliant on the community and voluntary sector um, in, in, in Ireland. And the community and voluntary sector, I suppose it, it, that's very broad and it encompasses a lot. And it would include groups that are funded, that, that have state funding, but also activist groups, um, locally based volunteer groups that come together to address issues in their uh, local community. Um, so that, that's very much underpinned then by a community development model. And the community development model in Ireland historically would have been community led, grassroots led um, activism to look at local um, issues in local communities, issues affecting um, people, particularly issues around perhaps long term unemployment, marginalisation, poverty, um, lack of equality in certain areas. And that's that was historically that's um, the, the how community education developed in Ireland, very much also influenced by women's the, the women's movement and women's community education has has shaped the way community education in Ireland has evolved, um, and then it's reliant on multiple funding streams. And again, there are a huge amount of groups um, that that work on a voluntary basis um, that, that work in, in the whole area of activism and, and maybe just rely on local resources and, and human resources as well. But, but in the community education network that we work with in Aintis, many of those groups are, um, they get some state funding, state support, that they're uh, community and voluntary sector organisations um, and they're very much reliant on um, multiple funding streams. And I'll, I'll show you just um, a little bit more about that in the next slide as well. Um, so it does get state support through the education training boards and SOLAS is the overarching body um, that uh, funds the education training boards in Ireland. There are 16 education training boards and within those there are, are um, adult and community education programs and they're part-time programs and there's a program specifically geared towards community education. Um, and that's the community education program. And within each ETB, there are community education facilitators and their role is to support 
community education, local communities. So it, it's that link between um, the education training boards and local community groups, and they, they support, they engage with groups, support them to um, highlight, identify and highlight their needs and provide funding, um, often through tutor hours, often through grants. Each ETB has its own way of linking with the local community groups. And it also receives state support through different programs, so social inclusion programs that the current program, um, one current program that we have is a social inclusion community activation program, SICAP, um, that replaced a community development program um, that we had a number of years ago. Um, so that there's a number of different programs and, and community education groups would be reliant on funding through numerous uh, programs. And again, I'll show you on the next slide how that works. And the tertiary education sector, so, so uh, and the academy and academia is really important for community education um, for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and one of the, the areas um, in which community education receives support is through training um, of uh, or the initial teacher education training. So that's where um, people may want to work in the area of adult community education and they can receive a qualification which is recognised by the Irish um, the Teaching Council here. And that's, um, I, I suppose it's over the last you know, 15 or 20 years, um, the sector has in some ways become quite professionalised. Um, so there are programmes um, in which people can get a professional qualification to teach and, and um, tutor in the sector. And, and that obviously has a huge amount of pros, positives, um, but there, there's some questions as well around the professionalisation of the sector because traditionally community education would have been very much grassroots led. It would often tutors in the sector would have been um, local people who had skills that they were sharing with their local community so that there's it's good to have often a mix and to ensure that that grassroots um, aspect of community education continues um, and also research within community education and AINTIS which um, have a lot of partnerships um, with um, third level institutions um, and working works um, with different organisations, particularly Maynooth University, we'd have a very strong partnership with and we'd be hearing from Camilla in a while. Um, and it's really important to have those relationships so that we can collectively um, work together to do research in the area of community education. And then obviously um, certain um, third level institutions do their own research in community education, adult and community education in, in loads of different areas in, in that um, around the, the uh, around the sector, um, and this is just um, I suppose it, it, the idea is to give you um, just a picture of the complexity of the sector in terms of funding. And this uh, actually, Camilla was involved in research um, as part of another EAEA um, or European um, project, Erasmus project called the Finale project, and it was looking at funding for adult education and we, we looked in Ireland at all the different funding streams for community education. So you can see there that it's it's hugely reliant on a number of different funding streams and it that, that could be like one organisation could be reliant on a huge number of funding streams. They're often small amounts of funding so there's a lot of administration and bureaucracy that goes with each funding stream. And I won't have time to go into it today, but that does impact on the ability of community education practitioners to be able to continuously um, focus on the, 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 I suppose, the ethos and the values that traditionally would have led community education, would have underpinned community education. And I'll talk about that um, in a moment. So that's when community groups are reliant on a huge amount of funding streams, when there's a lot of administration and bureaucracy around that, it impacts on the ability to maybe um, be able to create spaces for uh, dialogue um, to look at what it is that that's um, that's needed in the community education sector to respond to emerging issues in local communities and nationally and globally as well. But really the, the important um, piece for community education, particularly in the theory in community education is, is that it's, it's political. So it's responsive to local issues um, and it's, it's about collective action. 
It's about communities working together to be engaged um, in, in political action, um, in consciousness raising, um, in, in, in dialogue, in, in building communities, building solidarity. And it's very much influenced by the theories um, of Paolo Freire. Um, Educators as learners, a re really important part of community education, that the, the relationship between the educator and uh, participants is, is equal and everybody's learning from each other. And um, adults bring a huge amount into the room and, and local community groups bring a huge amount into the room. It's equality based and critical of the banking model of education, which Ferry talks about. So it's not about one person having all the lot. The knowledge and sharing that it's it's about the collective um, building of knowledge and information and collective action. And then some of the practice around community education again it, it's dialogic. The idea because it's collective because it's community focused. It's it's uh, there are often huge amount of individual benefits to people, but it's that the, the um, an overarching. A sort of uh, value of community education is that it's dialogic in practice and, and it's, it's collective. It, there's a strong focus on the collective. And um, group work is a very important aspect of community education. Um, critical thinking, um, and empowerment as well, because often people who engage in community education um, are marginalized communities. And the idea is that it, it's creating a space for people to build um, confidence and, and to give, give them back power. And that, that comes back to the political um, aspect of community education. It's collective, as we said, inclusive. So it's inclusive of, of people from um, different backgrounds. And that often is, is of value in itself, where pe people from different backgrounds, people with different life experiences come together um, in the one space. And it values people's lived experience. So again, that's about the, the, the equal relationship in the room between everybody and everybody bringing um, something into the um, into the room when, in community education. And it's responsive to local needs. So that's a very important aspect of, of community education, that it is responsive. And more and more so as well, the, the local needs are impacted by global issues. So it's very much focused on global also. Um, one of the key features of community education, Neve spoke about this when, when she did her introduction, um, is just that it, there's a strong focus on the wider benefits of community education. So I suppose in the last 15 years at, at European level and also at national level, there was quite a strong focus following 2008 on um, austerity and, and creating, um, I, I suppose, building the economy up and creating um, employment which obviously was necessary at the time, but it, the impact on adult and community education um, was that there was a strong focus at policy level on education for employment. And at, within the AINTAS community education network and, and, and members uh, are, are people working in community education, felt very strongly that it was really important to hold on to the, um, the wider benefits of community education and to keep promoting them and to talk about community education as um, a, it, it's a, about society and about the social um, as well as the, the economic, but, but primarily um, the wider benefits include personal benefits, community benefits, often these might not necessarily be economic benefits, but people engaging in their local community, giving voluntarily to their local community. And that's often linked to the personal and the confidence building because people are now, um, through engaging in community education, are, are more engaged in their local community. Um, it's not just about um, getting a job or not even necessarily about going on to further education. It's often an end in itself. Um, the, the social and, and political wider benefits, and, and we're seeing it more so now with um, everything that's happening in Europe and, and in European elections and, and um, with the war in Ukraine and so on, that it's, it's so important to hold on to um, the, the, and to acknowledge that community education has social and political um, benefits. So when you build communities, when you increase equality, that has, has um, benefits across the board and everybody benefits from community education and, and from widening inequality. 
community. And then the intergenerational benefits of community education are really important. So I just have uh, the, the pictures there are just two that there's so many reports about the wider benefits of adult and community education. But the, um, the, this was the, these reports that were done by Aintis and, and one in Limerick. Um, and it's it, it they highlight that community education is more than just about um, uh, um, developing skills or education for um, employment. And this charter for community education was developed by um, a group which we call the Three Pillar Group, and it's made up of members of the Aintis community education um, sector, of people working within ETBs um, in the area of community education, and people working in, in the academy, so Maynooth University in particular, but with people from different um, universities have been involved in our Three Pillar Group. And we, we came together um, as a group a number of years back, back in 2017, to look at how we could hold on to the values of community education. And this um, was put together, um, and we have beautiful uh, graphic illustrations by Emer McNally. Um, she she do, does um, graphic illustration, a, a lot of work in this area. And she captured the, the principles for us um, in a very creative way. But the idea of this community education charter is that it just sums up what it is that's important about community education. And we've asked community education groups around the country to display this in their local community centres. Uh, so it's just it's very um, broad. It, it shows the broad principles, um, and it's just what I've pretty much gone through there over the last few minutes. Um, so I think we'll, we can share a copy of the charter um, after the webinar as well. So I'll just move on. I'm conscious of time here. So just the ancient definition of community education. It sums up everything that we've just spoken about here. Um, I just uh, bullet pointed it there, but there's a huge amount there. So again, we can share this maybe after the, the webinar, but it's there's a huge amount in it that basically covers everything we've spoken about before. And this is the definition that the Aintis Community Education Network came up with a number of years ago. And I, I couldn't um, not draw on some of Camilla's work when we're um, talking about community education because she literally wrote the book <laughs> on community education um, a number of years ago. Um, and there it is there, Community Education, Neoliberalism, Philosophies, Practices and Policies in Ireland. And a number of uh, members of the Community Education Network participated in the research that Camilla did um, when she was writing this. Um, and this is just one of the, the findings um, of the uh, Camilla's research. And I, I just, I, I often draw from it and um, I think it, it sums up uh, the, the community education, the landscape in Ireland. And there are three models that Camilla had found when she was doing her research. Um, a universal model, a second chance model or, and a radical or critical model of community education. And the universal model um, it was a model that was open to everybody regardless of, of background or life circumstances. So these are models that community groups on the ground adhere to themselves. The second chance model, which is a second chance aimed at people who didn't benefit from initial education, and it, it looks to add to existing structures rather, rather than necessarily to change the structures. And then there's a radical or critical model of community education. And I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to all these uh, different models. And this is um, political and it's aimed at bringing about social and structural change and it encourages an analysis of the social and struct, um, political structures that shape people's lives um, and challenges the, the uh, structures that support oppression and inequality and obviously um, Camilla will go into that in a little bit more detail and what Camilla found when she did her research was that this um, about a third of community education groups adhere to each model, so a third to the universal, around a third to the second chance, and a third to the radical critical. But really, a lot of groups also said that they, it depending on the program, depending on the course, the funding stream, they might adhere to different models. Um, so, but overall, that that's what the finding, and I hope I'm I'm summing that up um, correctly, Camilla. Now I'm just trying to move on to my next screen here. Oh yes, there you go. So just the community education network itself then, it's a national network and it's dedicated to independent uh, voluntary community education groups who are committed to social change. So that was um, what the, the one of the uh, criteria was when it was set up back in 2007. We have membership across the country. 
And the meetings provide the space um, to network, to learn, engage in key issues related to community education. So we'd have about three or four meetings when we were face to face. We were having about three or four meetings a year. We've, we have had more since we've been online, um, but hopefully we'll be going back to face to face, including one of our meetings in June, um, which we'll have Regali um, network members attending also. Um, and we have meetings, so that's the, the, the space to share information um, and to share the issues happening on the ground and to look at how we can collectively advocate um, around those issues. And we also have, we provide training and, and um, on any of the areas that, that community education groups would like training on. Um, and we have communities of practice. So one community of practice that we have is for groups who are providing um, accredited courses. And there's a huge amount of work involved in maintaining quality assurance so that they can provide accredited courses um, for groups. So we have a community of practice that focuses on supporting those groups. And the idea in that community of practice is that there is so much knowledge on the ground among practitioners that they come together to share that knowledge. So it's not, um, it's not about us coming in and, and telling people how that they should work or talking about quality. It, it's the groups themselves looking at what does quality and quality assurance mean for community education and particularly around accredited uh, community education. And then um, we have a steering group of community education network members and they're all people working on the ground in community education. And it's, it's really important that the work is informed and guided by um, those people and, and those groups because it, it's ensuring that we're responsive to those uh, needs. And here are just some pictures of how we work. Uh, we, we work collectively, we, we, we do learning circles and um, we try and keep meetings as interactive as possible. And one of the other areas, and, and again, you spoke about this at the beginning as well, was around highlighting the value of community education, particularly among policymakers. So we're continuously trying to show the value of community education, trying to highlight the wider benefits, showing innovative work that happens because uh, around the country, because often this work happens under the radar. It, it often happens, um, I, I suppose, because groups are um, often struggling for funding, the, the work can very much go unrecognised because they're working away behind the scenes in local communities, but having a huge impact, which often isn't seen. So we find it, it, it's really important to create the spaces to share um, the work that community groups do. So this, these photos were from an event um, when I was looking at this last night, it was back in 2017, which I was, um, it's hard to imagine, it's nearly five years ago, but this uh, Emer McNally down on the, the bottom left-hand corner did, did a graphic illustration of an event that we had, and um, th it captures it here. And I think that even though it's five years ago, everything that, that she captured here, um, we had a number of speakers, including um, Jim Crowther from Scotland, everything that's captured here, I think, is, is becoming more and more relevant um, every day and every year. So I, we can share this um, illustration as well, but this was these were just some of the issues that came up at, at um, a celebration of the CEN um, that we had in 2017, celebrating 10 years of the Community Education Network. And it was very much focused on the role of community education in furthering democracy, developing critical thinking, um, you know, transformative education um, and looking at how we can respond to some of the social and global issues that we're facing. So I have a video here and hope, actually, I don't think it was, the sound was playing earlier. So I think I'm going to hand over, I think I've gone a little bit over time, but I'm going to hand over to Edgem um, to play the video, if that's okay with you, Edgem. set up the Community Education Network in response to the members' needs. They articulated the need to come together as a collective at national level in order to ensure that community education has a recognition of the value of the work that it does, how it's a distinct kind of provision within the lifelong learning field, in order to ensure that learners get the best possible educational experience that they can. I think community education brings excitement into the community. No matter what class it is, people get very, very excited about what they're creating and what they're doing and they build, build incredible friendships. 
community education plays a massive factor in anything to do with your mental health. Some of your audience are here, so just because your glass is back there, so it's been used this arm. Aintis was always a great umbrella group for, for community ed, but you know, when it became very specific with the network, it was really, really great. It was a great support. Longford Women's Link have been involved with the Community Education Network, with the CEN, since the very early stages. It's a really, really important network for us. To have a national voice has really, I don't think you could ever really measure the value it has. It's been fantastic. It's a fantastic resource for information exchange, for um, just learning from other centres. But particularly for us as well, we're a rural centre. It's a great opportunity for us to network with other providers that are in that, that situation. You get to meet other people. You know, where I mix them without any negativity, it's all positive stuff. Even if you're walking down the street, you know, I might see someone from the south side and you stop and talk, but you wouldn't even know a person over that being in the courses. You get to make a bond with people you wouldn't normally see on a daily basis. It's more of a relaxed atmosphere. There isn't like lecturers or teachers in the corner watching you. It's just you do everything at your own pace in your own time and it's just it's just easier I suppose. Up to a couple of years ago I suppose people would just stay in their own community. But I think the Living Community Education Network and I think Aintis as well and the Community Education Network with that the way they've worked with learners and having a city wide learner events, I think that has opened the horizons and has brought people together. We're like family, like we're great, the classrooms are great, the teachers are brilliant. You're made to feel at home the minute you walk in. Mm. You're not made to feel like, what are you doing at your, right. at your age, if mm. you know what I mean. It's like, everybody's welcome, everybody's there to help each other. Mm. It's just somewhere you look forward to coming. My colleagues in both class I, I attend, conversation in this class and hospitality course. My colleagues are very friendly and the teachers are very kind and friendly. I was out of the work for so long, I didn't know, can I do this? It was very daunting because I, I knew nobody. It really all fell into place very quickly for myself. Um, I got on great with the people that I met. I gained confidence very quickly. I met a lot of friends. They get the opportunity, I suppose, to overcome their barriers. They get the time to, to learn, there's no pressure. Um, they also get to gain confidence. This is a knock-on effect on their families and the wider community. Community education practitioners who are part of the community education network see it as a different kind of provision, one that's empowering and transformative, and the purpose of which is around social change, not about just getting an academic qualification. I think it's more the atmosphere, everything is more relaxed and you have a great support because there is a different nationality of women, there is different ages of women. I believe a community education centre needs to be big enough to be viable and small enough to know people by name. If you're an adult and you're going back to education, it's because you want to. You're there through choice and if you really love it and enjoy it, you'll find a way to stick it out. If you come here, they will sit down and talk to you as a person and say, well, where can we go from here? Everybody mm. tries to help everyone else, a, a community as it says. Thanks, AJM, and I think um, I'm handing back to you now at this point, so thanks for that. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, many thanks for such a comprehensive explanation of the sector and the CEN. I learned a lot, and I'm sure a lot of us here learned a lot from you too. A lot of food for thought, at least. Uh, and I want to check now, uh, we have a few minutes before we, we, you know, pass on to the next speaker. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to ask or comment now. Um, I can wait a second to see if anybody would like to ask any questions. Okay, I don't see anybody's raising their hands now, but uh, yeah, Nicole asked, is that a video available to share? Yes, we can share the video, the YouTube link to you in a second. Uh, please feel free to at least, you know, uh, ask questions in the chat box so we can come back to you and respond. Now I would like to move on for our next speaker, Dr. Camilla Fitzsimons. 
Uh, Camilla has been working in the adult education since 1990s. She's an academic activist with a particular interest in education within social movements and community spaces. She has a nursing background, but left nursing to work in the community education, which she did for around 15 years. Uh, Camilla's PhD and the subsequent book, Community Education and Neoliberalism, 2017, the largest national study of community education in Ireland, uh, focused on the co-option of much consciousness raising education by neoliberal forces. Uh, Camilla has a particular interest in the role of feminist critical pedagogy and has led out in many education initiatives. Camilla is a lecturer in the Department of Adult and Community Education of Maynooth University. Now I'd like to leave the floor to you, Camilla. Thanks. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to immediately disrupt things, if that's OK. I'm conscious it's Monday morning. Uh, mid-morning for some people, uh, earlier for, for others. So I'm going to suggest, because you've listened for a long time now already, that people take one minute, turn off your cameras, stick your head out a window, touch your toes, do a star jump, whatever it is you want to do. Just take one minute and then I'll start speaking. Great stuff. I think it's the nurse in me. I don't want to be blamed for anybody getting deep vein thrombosis from sitting at, a, sitting at computers. I think it's definitely going to be one of those side effects of the pandemic that we'll find out about in a few years time. So hi everybody, I'm Camilla. Um, and there you go, the dog doesn't start barking until I come on. Uh, really nice to be here and thanks for the lovely introductions. I don't have a PowerPoint to share. I am just going to speak, but I, I'm really sorry about this. I didn't say a word until I came on. Um, I'm just going to take a minute, actually. Excuse me for one. Sorry about that, the neighbours the neighbors can deal with it now instead of me. Um, I probably won't use the full, I think a half an hour was allocated to me because I really would love to leave some time for questions, discussions, comments, um, if that's okay. But I have been asked, I think, to, to speak about the theory bit. I guess the kind of critical theory was the uh, brief I was given. So there will be a little bit of kind of drawing on what has been said already by Neve and Suzanne, and then just infusing some, some other ideas. And I think lingering on some of the points that uh, Suzanne made, that I think resonate with me anyway, and I hope with other people. So I think I'm gonna just talk really about, about three things. I wanna say a little bit about my own pathway into community education. And maybe that'll spur people to think about their own ways in if, if people are working with groups. Um, and we have people from Norway, Ireland, Estonia, Greece, Moldova on the call. If there's anybody I've missed, stick in your location in the chat. So, you know, to be, to be very, very rich and different stories and ways in. Uh, I'm going to talk then a little bit about that kind of philosophy of critical thinking or critical pedagogy, as it's sometimes called. Suzanne mentioned Paolo Freire, so obviously he's a sort of a key thinker behind these ideas. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what people, what we can do as adult educators, because sometimes, you know, you talk about these big ideas and these big expectations that can be put on, on, you know, people to, you know, change the world and make things different. And it can feel very overwhelming and people often don't know what they can actually do. So just talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do as educators, some of the maybe, you know, practical steps uh, that we can take. So so I hope that that sounds okay. Uh, just to say a little bit, as I say, to begin with, with my own 
pathway in. So yeah, I, I did used to work as a nurse uh, in Dublin. But I think beyond my kind of occupation, you know, I would have a very middle class, pretty privileged background. Grew up in a nice part of Dublin city centre where, you know, there was parts of Dublin really were considered no-go areas was the sort of childhood that, that I was reared with, uh, kind of stumbled into nursing and really just couldn't settle, I think, even though I was 10 years as a nurse, but could never really settle in an environment that raised more questions, I think, than answers for me. And I think there was one, I just often remember one kind of turning point or maybe tipping point is a better expression, but when I was working in a residential setting for um, women who used heroin, and I remember a particular encounter where a young girl, probably 19, was sat in front of a sort of a panel of middle class, mostly male doctors and nurses, and really was, was sort of grilled in a way that there was absolutely no class analysis, no gender analysis, no social analysis at all. And she was kind of really just, you know, teared apart by these people who, you know, whose lives were very, very different to her. And I think it was a real turning point for me and all of the things that were wrong about the work that I was doing of lifting people out of kind of, you know, areas where there was a lot of financial poverty and expecting them to recover and then putting them back into those communities and then blaming them when they fail. And I think I wanted to be part of something that was a bit more kind of politicizing and a bit more of a collective. So that kind of collective sp space that we've talked about already. So I, I, you know, I applied for a job in a community development project and uh, got it to my surprise in one of those areas that would have been considered no go. So I remember, you know, family would be saying, oh, don't bring your car, you know, all that sort of sort of stuff that goes on, all that classism really that underpins so much of, of our society. But one of the things that struck me straight away was just the different language, you know, and Suzanne mentioned this, you know, people were talking about equality, they were talking about participation and dialogue, this thing of consciousness raising, and people were naming social class, which had never been named really in any space I'd been in before in my life. So it was completely different to anything I had experienced before. I mean, the first education group I was involved in, just like that picture Suzanne showed, sitting in a circle, you know, very dialogic. And I just remember it really turned everything I had known about education on its head. It was just so different. It was quite a jolt, I remember, to my system, just how different it was. And initially I remember thinking, this is really unprofessional. But actually now I think it's a model of, of good practice, but it was just, as I say, it was just so different. So that was the 1990s. And I mean, this wasn't just happening to me in isolation. I think that's a really important part of community education is that kind of historical context, you know? So in the 1990s, you had, um, I mean, there's always been community education in some respects. There's always been adult education. In Ireland, it goes back many hundreds of years through libraries. We also had a lot of education around Ireland's, uh, you know, Ireland was a part of the Uni United Kingdom until, uh, the early 1900s and there was a lot of you know politicizing education happening there but really from the time of the, the free state essentially up until the, the 70s or 80s really the education that was available particularly for women was very domesticating you know how to be a good housewife how to cook how to clean how to sew literally how to keep your husband happy was it was a lot of the programs so what was happening you know in the 1990s in Ireland later than in the rest of Europe, really started in the 70s and 80s, was this, you know, feminist movement that Suzanne talked about. In Ireland, you had the Irish Women's Liberation Movement of the 70s, Irish Women United. You had the Dublin Rape Crisis came together in the late 70s. And from the 80s onwards, you had this mushrooming of women's groups, mostly in working class areas, and often in partnership with critical theorists many of who were in the universities. So that kind of partnership that, that Suzanne was mentioning, really, that's where, you know, it, it, it goes back quite a long time. 
And at the same time as this kind of women's movement, you had a community development movement, which was mostly happening in the UK. And, you know, if something happens in, happens in the UK, it tends, to, it tends to travel over to Ireland. So you had this anti-poverty movement, which uh, was again alongside a literacy movement. And I know Mary Meyer is going to talk a little bit more about the practice there. But the literacy movement was really part of a broader United Kingdom, a uh, very political movement. That book that Suzanne mentioned, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire, translated into English in 1970 and did have a big impact in the 70s and 80s on community-based education. So is this okay? I hope this is, I'm doing okay for people. Do feel free to stick any questions in the chat. But I'll just keep talking for a minute then and say a little bit about the, you know, so what is this philosophy of critical pedagogy, this critical thinking that I'm talking about? Something that in Ireland was, uh, is actually almost enshrined in policy. I mean, it's quite long ago now. It's in our white paper from, from 2000, this acknowledgement of a second view of community education, uh, which is ideological and as a process of communal education is the way our, our, our sort of government document back then describes it. But I just want to really focus on four points about what it means to work from a critical pedagogy perspective. The first one of them is that your starting point is that the world is unequal. So that is where you start. We live in an unequal world. Increasingly, people talk about this intersectionality, which Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw is the person who came up with that expression. So this is that idea that our social class, our gender identity, our racialization, our absence of a disability, uh, our relationship with borders becoming much more th an issue for people, that these things are interconnected, they feed off each other, and that they create significant challenges and inequalities for some people in their lives, but there are also a significant minority who benefit from these structures. So I'm just gonna quote, there's a, a book came out recently and it's a free book, Free Thought FM is the, if anybody wants to, to Google it, it's, it's part of an arts project that a guy called Gareth Phelan did. Kathy Lynch wrote a really good article in that about inequality in education. So that's a 2022, publication. And just to give some Irish figures, which I know won't be relevant for everybody. So in Ireland, 72% of net wealth is owned by the top 20%. That's higher than the European average. Only 10% of households own any land. So land ownership is highly concentrated among the wealthiest. The top 20% owns more than 90% of all land by value, while the top 10% owns 82%. At the same time, in March 2020, there were almost 1,500 children living in direct provision centres. These are the uh, reception centres that Ireland provides for people who are fleeing conflict, seeking uh, asylum, uh, refugee status. And there was a further 3,500 children, in, uh, people, sorry, in homeless accommodation. So that gives you a sense of that, you know, really, really stark inequality. So that's the first kind of starting point of being a critical pedagogue is to say, this is, this is the world we're living in. The second, and this is, I think, a really important uh, point and something that can get missed is that the education system is seen as being a big part of the problem. So the education system isn't that great liberator, it isn't that great leveler, as is sometimes perceived. It is actually a big part of the problem. So this banking approach to education that Paolo Freire talked about, he's not just talking about bad teaching. So the banking being where the educator holds all the knowledge and passes it into the minds of passive, passive learners. It's much deeper than that. It's really saying that that is a, a system that deliberately maintains the status quo. So the alternative to that is this problem posing approach. So you bring people together in groups, you get people to share their experiences. These are validated and differences and similarities are uncovered. So if you put me back in that very early 
community education space I was in, as soon as I start to share my lived experience as a child, there's a huge contrast to some of the other people that were in the groups who had a much more, uh, you know, a, a childhood that was much more shaped by financial poverty, as an example. So you, you uncover these differences and similarities. And then the educator asks questions. Why is this happening? Who's benefiting? Who's losing out? What other possibilities are there? How do we go about achieving those possibilities? So it's that problem posing approach. So just to give a practical example, there was a very large community education project happened in Ireland a few years ago around housing in a, a very large kind of city centre social housing complex where lots of the children were presenting to their GPs with asthma. And they were all being treated individually. So all of the doctors were looking at the individual situation or putting them on medication. So community education, critical theory approach brought all of that together, brought people together into a space and realized that the problem was the housing. And that shifted the community response and the community action to putting in a collective complaint to the, the European Union, which was definitely influential in quite a large regeneration happening in the, in the area. So that's that collective, taking it out of that individual and putting it into the collective. <clears throat> the other sort of third point, just about education, uh, that kind of, is this myth of meritocracy. So this myth that is, as I say, this level playing field, you know, everything is equal, all things are equal for all children as they move through. This is a myth. You know, meritocracy convinces us that some of us are really clever, some of us aren't. So it kind of divides society into the smart and the not smart people. And any of us that are working in education spaces know that this, this just simply isn't the case. There's, there's no way that you can suggest that you know, I grew up in, in Dublin 6. It's, a, as I said earlier, an affluent area. Throw a stone down the road, Dublin 8, not so affluent. You have over 90% of people where I grew up going to university. You have less than, I think when I was a child, it was less than 30% in Dublin 8 going to university. That's not about intelligence. We know that. There's something else going on. So it's about exposing that myth of meritocracy. And then the fourth point, and something that Paola Freire is very strong on, it's just this idea as to, you know, the power of education. So education cannot change the world in, in and of itself. And Paola Freire is very clear about this. He says it's not just about education. So sometimes, you know, I mean, just to give a couple of examples, you know, people talk sometimes, you know, a lot of focus about gendered violence, in particular men's violence against women at the moment. And, you know, absolutely, we have to have a fundamental overhaul of certainly in Ireland, how we talk about consent in schools, how we support young boys and men to question some of the ideas around toxic masculinity, how we work collectively and collaboratively and across the genders in a united way. We certainly need to do that. But we also need to make much bigger structural changes. We also need to ask those questions I was talking about. Why is society organized in a patriarchal way? Who benefits? Who loses out? I mean, there was a report from Oxfam which showed, I think it's uh, over a trillion uh, dollars worth of unpaid labor that, that women undertake every year. You know, capitalism needs patriarchy to survive. To do that, it needs that kind of, you know, all of those ideas that perpetuate gender inequality to permeate down through society. So education alone can't fix that. It needs to be broader than that. And I think the same sort of thing can be said for climate justice. Absolutely, we need to change the way we educate, but we have to do much more as well. So this is where this kind of collective action comes in, bringing people together to take action on their circumstances to try and make change. So that's the praxis piece. I mean, the word that's often used is praxis. So just before I leave you all absolutely going, oh my God, this is way too much. I can't do any of this. What is she talking about? Just 
to talk about some of the practical things. And again, I, I mean, I, I will share this. Uh, I sh probably should have sent it through earlier, but that Cathy Lynch, she's a, a very influential academic and philosopher in Ireland. But the article she wrote recently, she breaks down very clearly what she thinks educators can and can't do. Now, she's talking particularly about school educators, but I think there, you know, there's some merit in, in thinking about, you know, okay, so this is too big, but I'm not going to crawl under a rock and do nothing either. So, so I've drawn a little bit from, from some of what she suggests we can do, um, because, you know, the humanistic approach, which is that kind of other approach where we do focus simply on the individual, it can, it does work, you know, people, we, you see enormous changes in individuals. You see fantastic improvements in people's lives. But, you know, who's not in the room is always a question we need to ask. Who's increasingly being marginalised? Uh, are those individual changes enough is, is the question, I think. So the first thing I think we can do is we can challenge knowledge hierarchies. So we can illuminate the fact that there are multiple intelligences, multiple ways of knowing, and community education is really good at showing that, for example, science and maths are not more superior to the arts. I mean, certainly in Ireland, we have a very strong history of community arts, and I know there are some community artists on the call. Uh, so, you know, really illuminate that and, and showcase other ways of knowing that are, are so important to challenge that kind of dominance of how we think about knowledge hierarchies. Second thing we can do is we can openly talk about structural equality. We can talk about it with our students, with our policymakers, in the media. So sometimes I think, and I do, I, I mean, I'm not trying to contradict what, what, what was said earlier. I think it's really important that we show policymakers the value of our work. But I think it's also really important that we raise the bigger questions of policymakers and say, why have we got an education system that is so, you know, that's, that's perpetuating inequality? I don't think we should be afraid to raise those issues and ask those questions. So as I mentioned, Jim Crowther earlier on, who's a, a Scottish-based academic, he did some work with May Shaw where they talked about strategic participation and strategic non-participation. And I find that a really useful kind of benchmark in my own life. You know, what are the spaces that I will get involved in that are strategically beneficial to the people who are not in the room, to the people who are impacted by inequality? And what are the spaces that I'm not going to make any difference? It's not going to change anything. It's just a veneer of participation. It's not real. So can I strategically not participate in those spaces? And Jim Crowther and May Shaw would say, use that time instead to create other networks, other spaces to bring people in who are typically excluded. Third thing we can do is we can adopt critical pedagogic methods in our classroom. And it doesn't matter what the topic is. I mean, sometimes people say, oh, sure, I'm teaching nursing. I can't possibly talk about inequality. But, you know, I really, I would challenge that. I mean, one of the example that I have in, in the book that Suzanne was mentioning, which is from my own practice, is when I was teaching a major award in healthcare. And I would include a social analysis module and we would talk about why is it that somebody from an affluent area becomes a nurse or a doctor and somebody from a working class area becomes a healthcare worker? What's going on there? We would talk about terms and conditions of people's work. I know in one group I was working with, there was a problem with vaccinations were being offered to qualified nurses and not to healthcare workers. So again, there was a collective, a collective complaint put in by that group. There's other examples. So Stephen Brookfield uh, talks about teaching ECDL in North African countries and how this was being funded by big tech. So, you know, the problem posing there is why is big tech funding these programs? Why are they training people? The answer is cheap labor. But if you don't ask that question, it doesn't encourage groups to go there to explore those ideas. And, you know, again, in Ireland, I think there's really important questions to be asked at the moment as to why are there a disproportionate number of migrant students in social care classrooms, in healthcare classrooms, many of who have existing qualifications. So I know nurses from with who are fully registered nurses in Nigeria, for example. Qualifications aren't recognized in Ireland. They end up working in low-paid, precarious work in 
uh, often privatized healthcare settings. Why is that happening? How do we raise those issues with our groups? And then the final uh, point I just have is I think we need to be open with our students. You know, lots of people, certainly in Ireland, I don't know what it's like around Europe, but we struggle with the bureaucracy of those multiple funding streams, struggle with the bureaucracy of accreditation. Talk to our students about this. There's no reason why we can't be open with our students about the challenges that we fa face, because again, that validates for them, rather than trying to squeeze them into an education model that hasn't worked for many people in schools, that perpetuates inequality, and that makes people think that I'm, you know, I'm here, Dr. Fitzsimons, I'm the clever one, and all the other people aren't. I mean, we really just need to, I think, expose and challenge that model. So that's everything that I have to say. I would love to uh, have some discussion, but I'm not sure, Ken, how you want to do that. So I can hand over to you. We can take questions now or later. I don't mind. Thank you so much, Camilla. Uh, maybe taking off the spotlight from me and see the gallery view, everybody. So uh, if there is any questions, we can see. Uh, we have you know, comments in the chat box, like, Camille, well, you're an inspiring woman. Thank you for the thoughts. Yeah, I think I'm going to print <laughs> off the chat and put it on my fridge when I'm making dinner this evening. And, and if I get That's any great idea, home, look at these comments. <laughs> That's a great idea, Camilla. Oh, yes, more coming here. But uh, let's see if any questions here or any comments from the audience. I'm just going to pick up on Nessan uh, about Kathleen O'Neill. I completely agree. Kathleen is a, I've, I've worked with Kathleen over the years, a wonderful contributor. Um, there's an Ain't This video about the CLEAR project from the mm. 1990s, I want to say, which Kathleen O'Neill features in quite strongly. And it's so inspirational. I use it with my, my own groups very often. So I don't know if this can at some stage even dig that up and, and stick it in the share. But yes, Kathleen O'Neill has done fantastic work in community education. Thanks, Nesson, for that. Sure. By the way, after this webinar, all participants will receive an email from the AEA with the links, you know, the uh, research that you mentioned, uh, you know, so they can reach. Don't worry, about, don't worry about that. And also the presentations we can stick into. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so maybe we can move on to our, oh, yeah, Panagiota said, like, I would be interested to know more about the academic community involved in community education besides the research field. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, one way we do is that we have a suite of programs ourselves from Manute. So we have a suite of certificate programs that we run uh, across Ireland, uh, increasingly some blended options where we try and instill the sort of ideas that I talk about. But I think, you know, we get involved in spaces like this too. Uh, and that's a big part of, I think, you know, keeping us out of the ivory tower and, and, and connected with practitioners. I know a big part of my, my work is, is working with practitioners. And then personally, I would be involved in a number of kind of activist spaces as well around, you know, some of the big uh, kind of political issues that are, that are facing Ireland. So, yeah, we try and get around. Um, we have a uh, we have a question from Suzanne about uh, like she says with the climate emergency and climate justice our most urgent issue how might community education respond? I feel like I should put that one back to back to Suzanne. <laughs> I think <laughs> for Suzanne, <laughs> as asking the question, <laughs> I think we need to explore some of the contradictions. I mean, you have a, a Green Party and government in Ireland who are talking about, you know, banning banning peat, which are banning turf, which is a form of fuel, which is important, and there's definitely scope for it. But in the same week, they are 
participating in a government structure that allows Amazon to build the largest data processing center in Ireland, in Meads, which will be much more damaging to the environment than anything else that would probably happen in Ireland. So these are the kind of neoliberal contradictions that we really need to call people out for and hold, hold them to account for. And community education needs to be part of that space. So, you know, if I was working in that, in a community education space, I would be bringing that example into my classroom. I would be talking to people about it. The morning after the Oscars of a, a debacle with Will Smith, the first thing I did with my group the next day is we spent half an hour deconstructing what had happened. So, you know, P Bell Hooks is particularly strong on kind of linking cultural, uh, you know, currency uh, through, through, you know, television and films in particular and using these as, as tools within our learning groups. And I think it's just not to be afraid to do that. I mean, nobody's gonna knock on our window and say, why are you talking about data center in me? I think, you know, Foucault's idea of self-policing, I think it's very strong. We self-police ourselves as, as educators all the time. We think we're not supposed to say that. Why not? Why not? Are we not supposed to be asking critical questions if we are critical thinking? trying to encourage critical thinking. Definitely. Suzanne Kyle has a question there. No, I, I was just going to also respond to uh, the other Suzanne's um, question, just to say that a new initiative um, funded by Irish Aid um, in Ireland is um, the SAILTA project. So it, it's a national project aimed at looking at developing, or, or sorry, embedding development education, and global citizenship education in the adult and community education sector. And AIMT is our partner in that project as our Maynooth University um, and Concern Worldwide and Irish Rural Link. So I'll, I'll put a link in the chat about that project. And there's loads of resources for community educators, for adult and community educators that the, have been developed by the team and um, the sale to team and they're really really useful resources um for tutors so I'll, I'll put those in that in the chat box thanks Adrian. amazing Suzanne thanks yeah Celta project is really interesting so I recommend you to take a look as well um thank you so much Camilla it was an I think we learned again a lot and uh if you have any questions please put in the chat box to the audience and also you, we can follow up with you afterwards as well but uh, I'm concerning of the time, and we have a great speaker here, uh, Mary Maher. Uh, she's been the director of the Dublin Adult Learning Centre, we call it DALC, since 1993. The centre provides basic education services to meet the needs of the residents, including people from the new communities living in the area. Uh, they cater for about 500 students per year. I think it's a pre-COVID number, but we can ask Mary about the current ones as well. Uh, DOC's mission is to ensure that its students are given the opportunity to avail of their right to develop their literacy and numeracy and digital skills to enable them to progress in their lives. Uh, the learner voice is the center of their work. And uh, Mary will be giving us the practical aspects of community education and the setting, maybe how they work in the center, how they listen to the learner voice and how they provide courses there. So a practitioner in the fields, you know, uh, views are very, I think, interesting uh, for us. So welcome, Mary. Thank you very much. And um, I... <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to follow Camilla, to be honest. And I'm I'm sorry now. I didn't prepare prepare a PowerPoint, perhaps. Um, uh, that that was great, Camilla. But as you say, you you were the the theory and the philosophy. I'm the practitioner, so mine is going to be a much more uh, practical kind of um, hands-on sort of what we do what we do in Dalk. But um, it is kind of interesting that everybody has kind of mentioned in terms of, you know, kind of the women's groups and where it all started in community education. And in fact, that, that is where Dad's history is rooted in that it was kind of uh, Liam Carey, who was very much part and parcel of adult education in Ireland, set up the Institute. And then they realized when they opened the doors of the Institute that so many people in the North Inner City couldn't read and write and they set up the literacy scheme. And then they also had an inner city mothers program. 
So I think it was the first recession when I started working in Delft nearly 30 years ago that the Institute was actually winding down and the piece that we saved was the inner city women's group and also the literacy scheme that became DALC in the 90s. And, um, and I suppose sometimes what comes up in terms of what's the difference in community education and literacy, we have always been a basic education provider because that has always been the needs of the area in which we work. But in terms of the, the literacy, I think it's very much, and again, it goes back to in the 70s in England, the on the move, it's very much rooted in, in literacy as a right and literacy in terms of what people want to learn to read and write. And I think it's, um, and I, I don't, unfortunately, I'm not able to put this link up, but I think it's perhaps really important that I actually give our meaning, what, what literacy is for, for DALC, and it was very much work that we did with all our students uh, to come up with a definition that uh, really we could all felt reflect the work. And, and, and this is what it is. Being literate means being able to read, write, spell, use computers competently to deal with situations in your own environment. It means being able to fulfill your own goals as a family member, community, citizen, and, and, and as a worker. So being literate depends on what you need or want at a specific time. Becoming literate is part of a lifelong learning continuum. And it's really, and I suppose when, you, when we say student-centered, I really think it has been something that we really strive to have the student center to everything that we do. And it's what the students want to learn, what they need to learn to fulfill their own goals. And it really is very different for every person. Uh, and whether that's to learn to read to a child, learn to read to fill out forms, or whether it's to get a job, it's all valid. And I suppose we've always stayed very committed to the lifelong learning, particularly in the last few years when there's that real push that we you know we make everybody literate so they can get a job. There's a huge amount of people that, you know, that is not central. It's not the reason they return to education. They return to education to improve their skills, to be able to be independent um, and to do things for themselves. Um, and I suppose what I've seen in the it's almost 30 years, the massive changes in the North Inner City, and, I, and, and I'm sure this is reflected in all local communities in every part of Europe, is that originally we were working with people who were born three and four generations in the North Inner City, and they were early school leavers, and they came to improve their reading, writing and spelling. It was predominantly volunteers. It was predominantly one-to-one. -one. But over time, when people did progress, they wanted to be part of a group and those of us that work in adult education, and I think Suzanne and, and, and Camilla have mentioned the importance of, of groups, because we all know that the students and the adults that come into us, it's not their fault that the system has failed them. So I think working in groups it really gives people the opportunity to share their stories and really build the confidence, because for a huge amount, they think it's their fault. And that takes a long time kind of to work through. And one of the things that we sort of feel um, we're dealing with what I suppose maybe is a kind of uh, a, a kind of damaged learner experience that people's experience of the system has been so damaged that it, they really struggle to um, to firstly come back. It's the hardest thing. And then, you know, kind of it takes a long time to build their skills and their confidence and their self-esteem. And I think that's the real value of the group work. And, you know, so we went from one to one to providing groups and then accreditation became an issue and we offered accreditation. Um, but our programmes, we still offer a huge amount of our work is non-accredited and there's a huge amount of students where accreditation doesn't, you know, isn't important for them. And, um, and then in the last 15 years, a huge amount of our students are from the new communities. 
um, and, and I suppose it's our, our, our profile would be, you know, people who come to this country with little or no education. You know, it's not people, we're not a language centre. So predominantly, you know, our work is working with people at the lowest skill level. And and I, and I suppose that brings me to um, our my next point. Uh, and again, Suzanne has emphasised it uh, and Camilla, our values. Um, that we really work to empower people. Um, and by that I mean is I think that when people build their skills and confidence, their self-esteem, they really feel they can, um, I suppose, I, 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 I think they find their own voice and they begin to believe their voice matters. And I think that that's really important. Um, I think we're about, as I said before, we're student-centred and and what I mean by that is not, I, th I think it's really important that people, and I suppose this applies to all adult education, it has to be relevant to what people want to learn, but also is that people learn at their own pace. And I think that's one of the biggest challenging, challenges in adult literacy, that progress uh, can be slow. It's not a quick fix. It's not a six weeks program, that it is, it is lifelong and it takes time. And I think one of the things, and if Suzanne and, or if Clara, unfortunately, the student that was to be here with me who now works in DALT is actually very sick. Um, but I think what she would say and all students say is that they could learn at their own pace. And that was really important coming from a system where everybody thinks, you know, you learn, you know, fast and that's fine. And we're all kind of the same. Um, so, so that's really that's really key, and that's one of the ch big challenges in, in, in accreditation because you're on a course and everyone gets a, a cert at the end. But, but for lots of students, it doesn't work like that. And um, I think it's transformative. Um, and I think, and again, unfortunately, Clara isn't here, but it does change lives, and I witness that every day. And I suppose it's one of the great things about community education. It is full of hope. Um, and, and people do, no matter how much, how hard their situation is, and we know that everybody comes, um, the world is not equal, and that's why we need to have community education and literacy, um, but no matter what, people can actually kind of make their lives better. So I really believe in, in the power of transforming lives, and we're inclusive. We really try to reach people who are most marginalised, and with the, the poorest skills who would not, who, who would really struggle in mainstream education. Um, now I'm getting lost, so I'm very open to, que to questions. So I, I suppose what I think in terms of what, you know, the changes that I've witnessed, that I think now people need the, the literacy level to requ required to participate in mainstream society even in the last 20 years, has changed dramatically. Um, so, so people really do have to have a high literacy skill level to participate fully. And what's really important now is not just read, write and spell, it's digital literacy. And that absolutely um, came to the fore during COVID. And we were very lucky that we did get the fund from the Mitigation Against Educational Disadvantage, and we were able to equip our students with laptops and tablets, and we were able to run online classes. It took a really long time to get there, but it really, really, um, it really meant that we could keep people connected, and that was really important. Um, I also feel, uh, in terms of the new communities, that I think community education really provides spaces where people can meet each other. And I think in terms of challenges going forward, you know, I think like Camilla has mentioned climate change, I think a massive challenge facing us all is how our communities and how we all live together. When you, when you look at the war in Ukraine, and when you look how kind of wars all over the world is that we really struggle to live together. And I think community education provides those spaces where different communities get to meet each other and get to know each other. Because I think kind of racism is born out of fear and not knowing. 
And um, so like it's one of, well, this was pre-COVID times and we actually did it this year during the AIMFIS Learners Festival is to just try and bring classes together to share their experience, share their story, their food, their customs. And we realized kind of we're probably basically the same all over. And I think it does help to bring down, down barriers. And I suppose the other issue is around the digital to really ensure that we actually don't leave anybody behind. And I think if there's anything we've learned in the last two years is we absolutely have left people behind. And that's a massive challenge that I suppose community education is, um, is trying to address. Um, now, I, if people want to ask me questions, um, I'm very happy to answer them. So sure. one thing that came up there, Mary, was just that the, and Tina mentioned just that, that something you said, just that the work takes time. Um, and I think that, that that's a really important point because it's, it, you're looking at often people who've had really negative experience of education and that it's often there's pressures on uh, community education providers to produce results or to produce outputs. Um, but it, it's to kind of highlight the fact that this often takes time. Um, you're working intensely with people. And another thing that struck me there as well is that you do the work really well in terms of the individual. You work very well one-to-one. -one. But I think particularly in Delk as well, you have a really good approach to the collective, both like it's a, within the community, within, within Delk, within the local community. And you can feel it when you walk into the centre, but also with your networks with other um, community groups around Dublin um, and nationally as well. And obviously you're, you're very influential on, on the CEN and on the steering group as well. So I think it's just that really good balance of the individual, uh, the one-to-one -one support and then the, the collective um, and community support. So there are just a couple of points there, but um, I don't know if you want and, to expand. And... Thanks for that. And and also, and um, Camilla mentioned it as well, in terms of we we can, we some people who come to Dalk, and particularly if some people from the new communities have never sat in a classroom before. So it absolutely takes time to become literate. Um, and, and also the other issue is it isn't just about access and the skills. People do have lives and have very complicated lives. And also, there's also lots of other issues in terms of direct provision, overcrowded housing, problems with kind of dampness. Um, so that all gets in the way of, you know, learning and the pace at which people learn. And, and I think uh, community education is a care model. And that is, you do have to take the whole person into consideration. Uh, and, and that's why it's not really a quick fix and it, it's, it's not meant to be. And I think th that is a massive challenge. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of heartened by Solace's commitment to community education, but actually the kind of the measurement for success generally and, and progression is progression to, to jobs, progression to further education. But for our students, progression is the application of skills it's been able to do things for themselves. And that's much harder to measure. And you'd be kind, I'd kind of worry about a model of trying to measure that because everybody's journey is different. Everybody's goal is different and everybody learns at a different pace. So it, it really, to find a model that tries to measure that, it, it could be so cumbersome. We spend more time trying to measure it than actually doing the work. And, and, and again, the issues, I think, in terms of like going forward, the big challenges for groups is to, to re-engage with QQI. So if we only use that as a measurement of success, I think small groups will really struggle with that. And, and that is a, a real massive challenge that uh, as, a, as a collective, we have to make sure that voice is heard. Mary, thank you so much. Um, actually, it's very, you know, I think interesting and great to see that you are centering the learner voice in your work and you're spending a lot of time on it and you are, you know, acknowledging that and you are also, you know, just building your thing on top of it, which is, I think, amazing. And uh, I hope we will visit your center in the, uh, you know, study visits we will do within the Regali project. If you are, you know, just welcome us, would you? 
I don't oh, know. they're very welcome. We get okay. <laughs> we get loads of visitors because we're in town. But it's great that we can now. I mean, we've missed it for two years, so we're delighted. And our students mm. love visitors, and they love people oh. coming into the classroom. And that, yeah, you know, that's kind of and and it, you know, like that's the openness. If, if you were doing accredited programs, sometimes mm -hmm. you don't have the space to That's do true. all the other creative stuff and have yes. people go through festivals <laughs> and have people sharing their own story. So, yeah. you know, um, so no, our students love uh, when visitors come, so people are more than welcome. That's great. So we have 40 witnesses that you said yes here, so we will definitely visit you in June. Wait for us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the, all the participants for their questions. And so you feel free to, you know, email us, ask us questions and also tweet, you know, share this event, whatever you want. But thank you so much for coming. I'd like to thank Nivo Riley, CEO of AIMTES. I'd like to thank Suzanne Kyle, Camilla Fitzsimons and Mary Maher for speaking today and also our EAA colleagues here, you know, hosting this and making this happen. Have a great day, everybody.